This is a nightmare scenario. It's the big day. You're going over to your girlfriend's house to meet her parents, and not a moment passes before her father begins pressing you on your mathematics. So, my daughter said you like math. Try solving this. 2 to the x plus 2 to the y equals 160. x and y are natural numbers. Find x plus y. Easy, sir. 160 equals 16 times 2 times 5, which equals 2 to the 5 times 2 to the 2 plus 1, which equals 2 to the 7 plus 2 to the 5. So x plus y equals 7 plus 5 equals 12. Your answer is correct, but there were some mistakes and oversights in your approach. So if we could do a little role play, suppose we're like this boy's fairy odd parents, and we have to swoop in and set him right, so that he may immediately correct himself and stand a chance at winning his girlfriend's parents' favor. Of course, his chances of ever recovering are slim now, but assuming the mother hasn't overheard this interaction, there may still be hope, and where the there is hope, there are brave men willing to fight to keep it alive. Having set our objective to correct the boy, the question is, what's the problem? What did he do wrong? And it's just that question which caused a humdrum hullabaloo on this Reddit post. Let's take a quick look at what the people said before we get into correcting the young boy. I can't imagine there was too much to say about this, but it looks like we have a little bit of, oh my god, not again! The older man says You're assuming this is an honest question. It's not. It's a meme. This has nothing to do with a real conversation between two people. But that's not the meme framework that is there. It's about the behavior you are modeling. It's about the behavior I'm modeling. What the fuck is your problem, dude? You're the one being rude here. Boys, boys, come on. As long as no one is messed with Dina, there's really no need for such a row. Okay, uh, setting that aside, let's get into the math. While opinions differ on whether or not the boy's solution genuinely falls short of the father's request, everybody agrees the one thing he could be missing, if we are to critique his work, is a demonstration that he has found all possible solutions, that this is the only one. He showed that x plus y could equal 12, but what if there are other possible values of x and y that would result in a different sum? After all, the father did say to solve 2 to the x plus 2 to the y equals 160, where x and y are any natural numbers. This beckons us forth to find all pairs of natural numbers that make this equation true. Now, as it turns out, x equals 5 and y equals 7 is the only solution. Obviously, we could have x equals 7 and y equals 5 also, but that doesn't change the sum of 12, which is our object of affection in this problem. So then the question we need to answer to save our boy is how can we establish the uniqueness of the solution? One very simple way is to look at the powers of 2 near our solution. We've expressed 160 using these powers of 2, could we possibly use a bigger power of 2? Well, the next biggest power of 2 would be 2 to the the power of 8. However, this is 256, which is obviously too big. So we already know that the powers of 2 in our solution can't be bigger than 7. Any bigger than 7 is clearly too large. So 7 is the biggest power we could possibly use, but do we need to use such a big power? Could we, for example, find a solution that involves 2 to the power of 6? Well, the issue is 2 to the power of 6 is only 64. And 64 is less than half of 160. So if we tried to bring two copies together, we would get 128, a number that is too small. And this means that two to the power of seven isn't just the biggest power of two that we can use. We in fact have to use it because if our powers of two were anything smaller, like two to the six and two to the six or any other possible pair of smaller powers, it simply wouldn't be big enough to equal 160. So to get a sum of 160, we are forced to use two to the power of seven. And of course that leaves 32 left over for the other power of two, which 
forces the other power of 2 to be 2 to the power of 5. So then we easily see that 2 to the power of 7 is forced, which also forces 2 to the power of 5 to make this equation true. And whichever one we call x, whichever one we call y, doesn't matter, but you add them together, you're gonna get 12. While this does demonstrate the uniqueness of the solution, some people may find it a little bit unsatisfying, since this was only really so easy due to the relative smallness of the numbers involved. We may find it more satisfying to prove that, in general, a number can be expressed in at most one way as a sum of two powers of two. And wouldn't that be better for our boy, so the next time the father presents him with a question like this, expressing a number as a sum of two powers of two, he can demonstrate uniqueness by referring to a previous result. And the good news is, this is a pretty straightforward result to prove. It's easy to see that if a number can be written as a sum of two powers of two, then the greater of the two powers is certainly fixed. Which is to say, there's only one possibility for this power A. And this is because at least one of the powers of two, two to the A or two to the B, at least one of them, has to be at least half of the total. Obviously, if both of these numbers were less than half n, then they couldn't possibly add together to produce n. So then, the bigger of the two powers will certainly be at least half n, and thus, there's only one option for what it could be. And that's because from half of n all the way up to n, there can be only one power of two. Because to get between powers of two, of course, you have to do doubling. So when we take a number, like half n, and double it to get up to n, there can be at most one power of two living in this pink space. Notice we're not including n itself in this space because if one of these powers of two was exactly equal to n, there wouldn't be any room for another power of two in the sum. So for the bigger of the two powers of two, we're forced to pick whichever power of two lives in this space because at least one power has to be this big and there's only one one option in this space. And since that biggest power of two is forced, necessarily that will force the other power of two to be whatever's necessary to make the equation true. Hence, if a number can be written as a sum of two powers of two, then indeed it can be done in only one way. Still though, all of this discussion has been quite specific. We began by looking at precisely the numbers involved in this problem and the powers of two that were near the ones that we use. And then we looked at the problem of writing a number as a sum of exactly two powers of two. These solutions are more specific than necessary. There is, I think, a most elegant way to resolve the uniqueness of the boy's solution, which is by citing an important theorem that, oddly, I don't see mentioned very often. And that's the basis representation theorem. We know how our number system uses base 10, but we're free to use a different base if we like. 325 is 5 copies of 10 to the 0, 2 copies of 10 to the 1, and 3 copies of 10 to the power of 2. But I could also write 325 in base 10. Eight. In base A, it's 505. Five. That's five copies of 8 to the power of 0, 0 copies of 8 to the 1, and five copies of 8 squared, or 64. The fact that we can use these different bases is dependent on our ability to express every number in exactly one way, no matter which base is chosen. And that's exactly the basis representation theorem. Of course, by answering the father's question to write 160 as a sum of powers of 2, the young boy has essentially expressed the number in base 2, what we call binary. We could write 160 as 2 to the power of 7 plus 2 to the power of 5, but we could also write that 160 equals 101000000 in base 2. And the base 2 representation of 160 tells us exactly what powers of 2 must be involved in its expression, 2 to the power of 5 
and 2 to the power of 7. And by the basis representation theorem, we know that this way of expressing it in base 2 has to be unique. That means that the powers of 2 must be 7 and 5, and so the sum must be 12. If you want to learn more about the basis representation theorem, there is a great proof of this result in the George Andrews number theory book, and you'll find the same proof on the proof wiki. I'll leave a link in the description. But as for the perilous conversation between this boy and his girlfriend's father, I think that after we swoop in and whisper this brief advice, he would have a fine chance at winning the father's approval and turning this train wreck around. But what do you think? Is the father right that the boy's approach had some mistakes and oversights, or is that completely overdramatic and pedantic? And how would you show the uniqueness of the solution if you were in the boy's shoes? God forbid. Let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and unsort the table. Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal. Wish to sell my own fake, I'm jaded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull the brain, push it all the way through the whole blue planet. Faded. Psycho, 